Welcome to our first ever Coaches Roundtable. I'm Jeff Garvin with Heidelberg Athletics, and I'm pleased to be joined by four esteemed gentlemen, Heidelberg legends. Uh, we have Dr. Jim Getz, Jim, a 1958 graduate who has basically held every title imaginable at Heidelberg, uh, from student to coach to athletic director to uh, interim president there for a while as well. Uh, Jim, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. We've got Jerry McDonald. Jerry, uh, another Heidelberg legend, uh, a graduate, uh, a coach, uh, a professor, uh, and, and really just recently retired. So, uh, Jerry, it's good to see your face again uh, instead of around here, but just here on the Zoom call. Uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. We've got Mike Hallett. Mike Hallett, a coach here for a number of years, left Heidelberg and is now the offensive coordinator offensive line coach at the University of Toledo. Mike, welcome back. It's great to be virtually back, Jeff. It's great to <laughs> see the prison walls of your office. I miss it dearly. <laughs> <laughs> and we have our current head coach, Scott Donaldson. Uh, Scott's been here uh, since 2004 and took over after Mike left. Scott, always a great uh, pleasure to see you. I guess. Yes, you're right across the hall right now, but I, <laughs> I appreciate you guys here. <laughs> this way we don't have to wear masks, so it, it works out. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so the purpose of this Coach's Roundtable is just to get some, some Heidelberg legends together and, and, and talk about the history, the future of the program. In this case, we're talking Heidelberg football. Uh, Jim, let's start with you. You went to Maslin, a legendary high school for football in Ohio, and then you came here and you played for Paul Herneman. What drew you to Heidelberg uh, and, and to play for, for the Fox? Well, the Heidelberg had a, a great tradition of being a, a, a good football program under Coach Herman. You know, he was our head football coach, but he also was our head uh, basketball coach. And, uh, and he just uh, had, had the personality that uh, he could talk you into doing anything. Uh, so uh, I, I would say that the, uh, the charisma about Coach Horneman uh, brought a lot of people there. And that, that was one of my main reasons to be in there. So, and, and I enjoyed all those four years of playing and then enjoyed coming back in 1964 as a coach. So uh, there, there's a lot of attraction there being to Heidelberg and watched uh, Coach Hallett and Coach Mack and, and Coach Donaldson on practice field and in, in, enjoyed that as much as I did coaching. So that, you, that's – go ahead. You, you played alongside some, some absolute legends, some guys who had uh, a ton of success in the NFL, uh, Jim Bokey, uh, Jim Grinchman, we all know, Walt Livingston. Uh, how much talent did you guys have? Oh, I, I think we probably had a, a strong of, of, of backfield as uh, – Heidelberg's ever had. We had <clears throat> Roy King was our, our uh, fullback, and he ran like a uh, a running back, uh, and he was a running back. We ran a lot of uh, a trap plays with with Roy. Uh, we had Billy Groman at one half back, and Walter Livingston at the other half back, and uh, Brian Pow Pow Powers was our quarterback, uh, and Jim Gruden probably would have been our quarterback. Uh, if uh, we didn't have to play both ways. Uh, those four years, the NCAA decided that they would go into an experiment and uh, you had to play both ways. And if it came out of a quarter, you couldn't go back in that quarter. So there were, uh, I'm sure Jimmy Gruden would have been our quarterback, but uh, there was no way he could play uh, free safety. <laughs> so at 5'7 at or 5'8 or whatever he was. <laughs> But uh, th that was that was a great backfield, and then and then of course we had Jim Bokey and and, and Bob Gilmore, uh, both of them uh, who assigned with the NFL. So uh, it, it was it was a team just full of talent, and uh, I was fortunate to play with play with them. Jimmy Bokey was <clears throat> I played right end, and Jim played right tackle, and of course we had nothing but tight ends in those days, and, and no no split end. And, and, and uh, Jim was always worried about his play. We'd he'd call play in the huddle and get back up, and he'd say, Jimmy, is it on one or two? What's we going on, one or two? <laughs> it's on one, Jim. <laughs> so, but he was, he, he was an excellent player, as 
you, you know, he played for, <clears throat> with, with the Cowboys those years, an excellent line, uh, lineman. So, uh, yeah, we had a lot of talent there, Jeff. Absolutely. It seems like Heidelberg football has had these tent poles of, of strong play, and then it sags a little bit and comes back up. Uh, after the Herneman era, then in 1972, uh, Pete Risen takes the team to the Stag Bowl. They go 11-0 that season. Jerry, you were a part of that team, uh, just a freshman, I believe. Yes, that's correct. What was that ride like? You're getting to college. It's your first, you know, your first months on campus, and there you are flying down to Alabama to play in, in you know, what was essentially a national championship game. Right. Well, my father uh, played at Wittenberg with Pete Risen. And, uh, and so Coach Getz can affirm this, that while Pete was a head coach, my dad uh, really pushed uh, – a lot of people, uh, a lot of his players come to Heidelberg. In fact, there was around 10 of them uh, over that, uh, that span, uh, 70, 70 to 76. There was about 10. But anyway, actually, there was four of us from my class that came in that year. And, uh, and a couple of them contributed heavily. Uh, Dan Brown, Brett Smith, Rusty Bartley, uh, the kicker. And I was uh, one of the backup quarterbacks to Jim Ruth during that time. We had a really successful high school career. So we came in there, and you don't know what's going to happen uh, uh, when you get in there. You don't know how good everything is. But it was, it was, well, it was definitely one of the greatest experiences I've ever had is to be a part of, of that team with some of the legends like Jim Ruth and Bob Hunt and Tom Kaufman uh, and some of those guys that I still stay in touch with. And, uh, and of course, Coach Getz was right there the whole time, too. So, uh, yeah, 1972 was a, was a phenomenal time in Heidelberg football. Uh, so then you – after you graduate, you come back and, and, and you're here as a coach, um, I think, in Dick West's first or second year here. Uh, 1984, I think, was your first year. Uh, back as coach, and, and you started, and then you moved right in pretty quickly to the offensive coordinator role. Um, and you have Shane Fulton, who is as big of a gunslinger as I think we've ever had here. Um, yeah. His name was all through the record book in the passing uh, categories. And then you had Bryce Tui, and you had uh, other running backs who could just, uh, Jeff Brock could carry right. the ball a million times. And, and in fact, you made Jeff Brock carry the ball but I think 41 times there in his last game. How is an offensive coordinator to switch um, to, to face, to, you know, to, to match your personnel? Well, I guess that's, that's what coaching's all about. And, and with, uh, with the men that are here with me tonight, everybody understands that. But we did have uh, that, that first couple years here, we had Chuck Ritzler, who was an all-conference uh, receiver. We had Chuck Longnecker who got the Gregory Award. And then we had Shane Fulton uh, who, when he graduated, had passed for more yards than anybody in the history of OAC. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and then Bryce, who was a very special player, of course, came in. And uh, uh, we, well, you got to, like you say, you got to play to your talent. And so we switched a little bit more uh, to the play action and, and, uh, and more of the running game. We started, I spent some time at Michigan, uh, with the, you know, learning the I formation and the gap schemes and counter schemes and zone schemes, all that kind of stuff. And so of course, Bryce, Bryce was, uh, quite a player. When he graduated, he was the all time leading rusher in OAC history. So within, uh, within about, a Six-year span, we had the leading passer in OAC history and the leading rusher in OAC history. Uh, so uh, I guess we, we did okay adapting uh, to our talent. And you mentioned Jeff Brock, uh, and he came in and, you know, you got a big gun, you shoot him, and uh, he, you know, actually passed Bryce. Uh, we had Greg Lear come in then who uh, – was it was a wonderful receiver um, and the best I knew uh, at that time. And then uh, uh, of course, coach Hallett had a couple 
and so hasn't Coach Donaldson. They've had a couple guys that that are actually uh, have been looked at by the pros. But uh, yeah, that, blessed with working with some uh, wonderful talent. And yeah, I guess I like to say we uh, we altered our offense to to take care of the talent that we had at that time. And very fortunate to have Bryce and Shane and some of those people that we're talking about. So. So after those teams in the 90s, and there's another a little sag there, and then Mike Howell walks in the door and, and um, at probably the darkest time, I think, in Heidelberg football, just in terms of where the team had been uh, with success on the field and, and having hired Scott Donaldson as a, as a graduate assistant. Um, Mike, what, what is, was there something that happened that helped you have that success that not a lot of people see? Was, what was that magic – how did you start that? Um, well, one, an AD that was awesome. That's Jerry Mack. Um, and, you know, Jerry and I had great conversations through the interview process and, you know, and ended up, I, I had an opportunity to come to Heidelberg and was leaving this place that, that I thought was pretty special, but I thought Heidelberg was, was really cool because I knew the success, having been an OAC guy, uh, knew what Coach Hornerman had done, um, and, and thought, man, that, that's a place that could, that could use something different. And, you know, I think the school was really committed to making it something special. Um, you know, with uh, Dominic Dottavio and Jim Troja kind of at the forefront and Jerry Mack, there was, let's get this thing going. And, you know, when I walked in and on day one, I didn't know, I knew Jason Bendekovic, you know, knew him a little bit. I didn't know Scott. I didn't know Corey Filipovich. I didn't know anybody on staff other than maybe a casual high at a camp. Um, but I saw a bunch of people that were willing to work. Um, and then when the kid, you know, I got hired in December. It was basically Christmas break. I didn't meet any players till we got back. And, you know, we have our first team meeting and, you know, all these, all these bodies show up. There's 95 kids in this team meeting. And Scott and Philly knew the kids are like, you know, they were calling out pretenders and, and contenders of every kid's name because I didn't know anybody, you know, I didn't know anyone. Um, and so we, we just figured it would be really good to test kids by fire. Let's see who's going to stay and who's not going to stay. And we're going to make it as hard as humanly possible. And the kids that will stay, they'll fight because we're going to make it really hard. And we made it really hard. And the numbers dwindled, you know, we call that uh, trimming the fat or addition by subtraction. And we got down to our roster of guys that we thought, there's talent here. I thought there were some misplaced talent. You know, Kenny Sims, who I thought was an electric player, was playing slot receiver, and he might catch three or four balls a game. And I'm like, I think we can bulk this kid up and play him a tailback, and he can get a bunch of carries, and we can make him pretty good. And then we added Jamal Lewis, who had left Ashland, and now we got a one-two punch. One and two is better than just one. You know, I kind of, kind of grew up in a, in a military history family where. One, you know, two is one and one is none. So if you got one good tailback, you ain't got any because one injury you're cooked. And now all of a sudden we got two and we tried to have a pretty good balance throughout my time there having two of everything because two equals one, one equals none. Um, Steve West is one of the toughest kids I've ever met in my life because he got his face pounded in, but he kept playing. And the, the initial success we had in 2007 was the Steve West driven team with pieces and parts, but not a complimentary offense around him. And Jeff Filkowski was here as the offense coordinator and ski, you know, ski had been at Cincinnati and he'd been in NFL Europe and we got him late. He made about 38 cents for the year, but he coached his ass off, did a good job. I was over on defense with Scott and Philly and those guys. Um, and I'm not any guru of a defense coordinator. We just want to stop the bleeding and bring it down. Um, and, and I think we did that. We just tried to play sound defense and tackle people and not let the ball get behind us. And we did the best we could. And, and from there, it just, you know, it, it really became about recruiting better than what we had. And that wasn't a knock on the kids that we had, but it was let, let's out recruit the, the kids on our roster because then that's when we're going to jump. And we kind of muddled along for a few years. It was interesting that the first recruiting class we had had three OAC players of the year in it. You know, when they were seniors, Nate Cater and Mike Preston and Andrew Miller ended up being great players for us. They weren't 
none of them were great as freshmen, but, you know, Mike played and Cater started and Miller was a knucklehead as a backup to Steve, but he learned a bunch and ended up being a good player. And then the second generation, once those guys graduated, is where we really saw that evolution of, you know, a big jump from our talent's okay, our depth isn't good enough, our twos are fours. Um, and we were able to stockpile a roster that gave us a chance to be among the good teams in the OAC. And that was kind of the next five years that we felt, all right, we, we can go toe-to-toe with people and not back down. And I think some of that showed up on film. I think across the OAC, when there's teams that are struggling now, I think in that, that search committee, they, they are looking for their next – they're looking for their Mike Hallett's to someone to, to come yeah. in and do everything you just described. Um, when, when did you think, all right, we're, this is – we're set? Never. <laughs> Ever. Um, you know, the, the thing that's frustrating, and Scott would probably echo this, if you went back and looked at our 2007 games – where we went four and six, we were about 17 plays away total from being seven and three. We were going to get our, we were going to get caved in by Mount. We didn't have a prayer there, but you know, the John Carroll game was winnable. The Otterbrine game, Otterbrine game, we lost in the last minute. You know, we just couldn't stop an individual route on the boundary side, you know, there in, in the Wilmington game, like we, we threw away three games that would have given us a seven and three record. And I would have loved to, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but I would have loved to see what would have happened after that. You know, six, four and six, that's great. But we were kind of muddled there. And, and really, we had, to, we had to get through the kids that didn't believe you could win. Because every game for, a, for years were so many kids that, I, oh, I was 0-36. Oh, I was 0-26 before. I was 0-16. You know, there's, there's a, a – that's tough, man, for those kids to – to have a different mindset. We just kept chipping away. And the breakthrough that five and five year in 2010, all of those are frustrating for us because there's winnable games there. And we were probably better in seven than we were in eight and nine talent wise. 10, we were probably better, but just had, had some really weird things go on. And then after that, it was kind of a nothing against those players because they were great. The West brothers, Lucas Bauer, DeWan Roddy, I mean, there, there are some really good players and they're all conference players. But it seemed like 2011, there was a collective deep breath, a cleansing breath of getting all that crap out. And then we really started rolling because that was really the, the graduation of the kids that went over oh, whatever. And that was a really, I think, a really changing moment that I would never say that we ever felt like we were there. But starting in 2011, I thought we had – a really good chance to be something pretty special and be able to maintain it because the coaches have done a great job of recruiting and there was just talent like, okay, this kid's down. Cool. Next kid in, we'll be okay. And that's in the OEC. I think because there's so many bodies stockpiled, your twos are more important than your ones because when there's an injury, do you step down or do you keep going? And, and that, that to me was where I thought we, really even the playing field with the top teams was when our, when our depth became really competitive. Scott, what's it like to be the coordinator here and then move into that, that head coach role um, where you, you know, everybody on the roster, you didn't walk in like, like Mike did and, and not know a single soul. You knew everything that you had. What was that like? Oh, um, you know, I, I think it was, it's a lot easier than, you know, like I don't think they interviewed on Heidelberg's campus, did they? No. <laughs> I think she cherry hatch over at Carby's. Uh, yeah. You know, so I mean, he, he's coming to the campus. He doesn't know anybody. He doesn't know the buildings. You know, I, I by the time I was head coach, I was here for ten years, eleven years. Um, not only did I know the roster, I knew the coaches, I knew the school, I knew the area, um, and that's. I think the most important thing is there was no delay for me. You know, I already knew the school. I didn't have to be taught on, hey, these are our majors. This is what we're good at. Um, this is where you go to get copies. This is where you go to you do anything. You know, I, it, it was just, all right, let's 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 roll now. Instead of meeting with Coach Hal, they're going to meet with me, and let's keep going. Um, it, it was pretty seamless. So I think I, I have all the respect for guys that, that can come into a job when they've never 
never been at that school before. I think that's a hell of a lot tougher than what I had to do personally. We have in, in this Zoom here, we have, stretching back to the 1950s, what is about OAC football that is, that is so important? And, and anybody can you know, feel free to chime in. Purity. I, 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 yeah, I think that the greatest thing about the OAC is basically you have student athletes. You don't have people that are just there to, because they're on a scholarship. And, and I'm not taking anything away from scholarship schools. I wish we had more. But, uh, you know, the, the kids came there, they wanted athletics to be part of their education. And I think that that was true at, at every OAC school. Uh, the kids came there, got a good education, and athletics was a big part of their education, big, probably the biggest part. Yeah. I also, I also think that historically, I mean, the OAC is what the third oldest conference in the country. Uh, I think it's the Cadillac Division Three school or Division uh, conference in the country, and the rivalries, the BWs, the the Heidelbergs, the, back in the day, the Wittenbergs and the Denisons, and uh, all that kind of stuff. It's just uh, just the history of that, and being a part of that makes makes the whole experience uh, so much more special uh, than it is other places. I, I would agree. I think the, the tradition of the OEC is what brought brought me out here. You know, I, I didn't have a conference where I played in, and coming to such a tradition rich, you know, everything, not just the football, the schools. I, I mean, we've been playing ball the wall since what, 1995. You know, um, so it, it's uh, that's unbelievable. But you look at the conference now, presently, in you know, obviously, I can't speak to before 2004, but it's not just great football, it's great coaching. There's great people in this conference. Very rarely do you – is someone going to hire someone that's just a, a bad person or a bad coach. You have great coaches. You have great people. Um, and really, a lot of coaches do it the right way. Yeah, my, my word I kind of said was purity, and it kind of echoes what all these guys have said, that – you know, yeah, I coach Division One football now, but I miss my Heidelberg guys. I miss seeing Quentin Rembert in the weight room just working to work or Austin Hunter or, you know, the litany of guys that would just show up at 6 a.m. on a Monday because it was Monday and we got to do work. And it wasn't because there was a scholarship check and it wasn't because we're going to be on ESPN and it wasn't because of anything. It was just because that's what was expected. And the level of expectation that those guys set for themselves was really, really impressive. And I agree with Scott that the coaching is unbelievable in the OAC. And we, certainly we've had, you know, in the, in the history of this conference, some legendary guys between Coach Herneman, Coach Sherman at Muskingum, uh, Coach Packard and Coach Tressel at Baldwin Wallace. You know, uh, Coach Karras at Mount Union won a couple games. He's pretty good. Yeah. Um, you know. There's, there's like a litany of guys, and what's funny is the guys that maybe aren't that good, they don't last very long. You can see it. Like, that guy was there for three years, and he's gone. You don't leave OAC jobs very often unless there's something really, really awesome out there, or you weren't really good at what you did. Yeah, so, I, want to pick, I want to piggyback. Excuse me, Mike. I, uh, no, you're I, good. I, I agree with you. Uh, you know, I was – fortunate that, that I became a director of athletics at 28 years old in the Ohio Athletic Conference. And uh, I looked over there at Bill Edwards at uh, Wittenberg, coach for the D he was head coach of Detroit Lions and uh, Ed Sherman and, and uh, Lee Trestle. And uh, as uh, uh, Jerry said, there they were just good people there. And I, I'm just a young guy. And uh, uh, Lee Trestle and, and Eddie Sherman and, and, and uh, uh, those coaches, just athletic directors and, and coaches, uh, just took me under their wing and said, Jimmy, you have to do this, and Jimmy, you need to do that. Now, we had some teams in the uh, OAC that, you know, football wasn't a big thing for them, but we had uh, the other teams that football was everything for them. So, uh, uh, you know, we had that kind of a 
a balance between the, the people that were swimming champs and the people that, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that did, didn't do a whole lot with the, uh, with, with, with their football program, but uh, they were all, all good guys. And, and you could ask, and you pick up the phone and call any of them and then answer a question, just like you coaches do, uh, Mike. You talked a little bit about rivalries, uh, Jerry. Uh, so really with Heidelberg, we've got two now trophy games. Um, there's the Rhine River Classic, the Rhine River Cup, uh, but you were a part of that team that went over to Germany. I mean, it's hard enough to prepare for a Saturday when you're traveling down to Westerville or to, to, to Bexley or, or, or New Concord. Uh, how was it traveling over to Germany? Like a meaningful game. Well, I, I can tell you this that uh, <clears throat> I think Coach West would tell you what an experience, but what a – it was not good for our season. I believe it was the third game of the year, and we had a pretty good team. And uh, with, with uh, getting that many people over there and uh, the whole thing, you know, if it was the first or the last game, I don't know. Uh, some teams have done it uh, at the end of the year and, and all that kind of stuff. But when we did it that year, uh, wonderful experience, great culture for the kids to get over there, uh, two schools that have German heritage, all that kind of stuff. Okay. But we came back after playing to a 7-7 tie against, I will tell you, a team that, we probably were three, four scores better than. Uh, but we came back, and we still were a good football team. We played John Carroll, and half our team got the flu on the way back, and we, we didn't practice. We didn't have a full practice the whole uh, week, and then we played John Carroll, uh, who on a good day we, were, we could play with. Uh, but unfortunately, it was a bad day. Plus, uh, we were just physically and emotionally a wreck, and and we never really recovered from from that. Uh, so I hate to throw, <laughs> I hate to throw a a, a a bad note on that experience because it was a great experience. But being the third game of the season, that was not a good thing. That was not a good thing uh, for for the program or for the kids uh, at that time. So. Sorry about that story. <laughs> well, uh, Jerry, I, it's all Jerry, part I, of the history, right? Jerry, uh, I and then now, uh, recently, there's the the Ben Dekovic, ben Dekovic Bowl, uh, the Bendo Bowl. Uh, Mike, you were instrumental in getting that started with Ohio Northern to honor uh, Ronnie and Jason Ben Dekovic. Uh, Scott, you're carrying those those traditions on now today. Um, what is what did Bendo mean for the program, and what does that traveling trophy mean? For the the family. Well, I think we did it to honor to honor Jason and RM, but I also had a really good relationship with Ronnie because I was really close with the Ohio Northern staff when I was at Thomas Moore, and I I knew Ronnie really well and played against both Ronnie and Jason in college. So I knew those guys intimately because we butted heads a few times and thought they were great humans, um, really good people. Um, and that proved out as you get to meet their, their brother and their sister and their family. Like, why would you not want to do something that affected both programs? I, I think it was really, really, you know, we instigated that. And, and it was probably to our advantage because to our kids, Jason was a, you know, Chief was a, a really big part of our kids' deal because they had all known him. Um, Ronnie had passed a few years earlier. I don't know if Ohio Northern – you know, if their kids knew Ronnie like our kids knew Jason, and Jason was such an integral part of our recruiting part of it, not just a great coach, but, man, he recruited Cleveland, and, and we, we got really good, and we recruited Cleveland really well. It, it was no secret to that. That was the lifeblood of what was Heidelberg going to be. We were going to beat BW on every recruit. We weren't going to beat the John Carroll kids on the John Carroll kids, but we're going to go tooth and nail on the, on the kids that would normally pick BW – we'll build a hell of a good blue collar football team. And we felt like we did. Um, so that deal I thought was really, really special. Just, you know, you got two schools are an hour apart. Why are we not playing for something? I know like when, 
when Coach West came over here and he was at Ohio Northern, that was a really bad blood kind of deal between Heidelberg and Northern. And I guess probably because Dean and I had worked together, we were teammates. It was a good, healthy rivalry, but it wasn't like – it wasn't bad blood. Like I respected Ohio Northern and what they did because I knew their inner workings because I'd been a part of it with Dean and Thomas Moore. And I think he understood what we were doing because – he and I had worked closely together, so it, it made sense to us that these are going to be two really good, classy programs that we're going to respect each other, and we're going to play our tails off for each other, you know, for our kids. Um, and you know, it's it's been. I'm glad we started because I think it's like nine and one right now in favor of Heidelberg. So if that gives the kids a reason to go beat them, awesome. Let's go. Let's win the backyard rivalry for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, you know, obviously, it's still very cool to me and the rest of the staff. But I mean, you have Jason Lewis, who coached under Bendo. You know, Jake was coaching when Bendo was here. Bendo recruited Jay Lou out of Bedford. Okay. Um, you know, so with our staff, it, it's still really important to us to honor Jason and Ronnie. And I knew Ronnie uh, through Jason. Um, that rivalry is, 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 is as real as it gets right now. <laughs> um, you know, it's, 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 it's a bad blood rivalry between, with the kids. It's pretty, and I love it. It's great to see, you know, our, our kids get amped for that game. It, it, it has been unbelievable. Um, you know, and we, we've been able, lucky enough to, to get, um, uh, Mrs. Um, there and the family back for uh, for a couple of the games that we've had at home, and it's a really, really special thing that that it hopefully carries on long long past on here. Absolutely, we've talked a little bit about a lot of the big names throughout the history, um, Shane Fulton and, and Bob Briggs, and, and uh, we haven't talked about Cartel Brooks and 465 yards um, and setting that NCAA record. Um, but who are the names – what are the names of the, the players who were they, – maybe they weren't all conference guys, maybe they weren't all American guys, but they, to you, epitomize what Heidelberg football was all about. Well, I, I want to mention someone here because uh, <clears throat> you don't see this happen much, and everybody here will tell you this, but this, this young man, his name was Jeff Sweeney. And uh, – I was coaching the offensive line at that time, and uh, he was just a, a, a football player on the team. But he always did what you said, and he always was so coachable. And even when it was time to go to the scout team, you know, he would sprint down there and do all that. And he never started a game and hardly ever played, but still. As a junior, he was running down to the scouts team and, you know, backing up a little bit. But he always knew his assignments. And during practice, he was just, uh, uh, you know, just busted his butt and did everything you asked. All of a sudden, as a senior, he's a starter. Uh, we went. Six and four that year. That's the year we we beat Mount Union, uh, and one of the key blocks on Bryce Dewey's ninety-four yard touchdown run was a senior year. And I, I'd like to you know, there's not many stories where somebody doesn't play or start for three years and still stays with it, uh, and and then to to come back and uh, and be a starter senior year and have a have a good year. He's he's one of my favorite stories. That's awesome. That's all. I mean, there's so many. I've been here so long, and, you know, there's so many that come to mind. But kind of going off Jerry Max is Jimmy Gephardt, our quarterback last year. You know, Jimmy didn't play right. down, and his father actually was Shane Fulton's backup. Right. <laughs> you know, um, and he didn't play really a down until – his senior year and ended up breaking his passing records, being first team all conference and just really lights out for us. So, um, but there's so many, I mean, you look back at, you know, Eric Depinette never started a game was voted captain. I mean, played about 20 snaps his junior year 
and was still voted captain by his teammates. That's pretty unbelievable. And there's a million stories like that. You got one, Mike? I do. Like, there's a lot of unsung heroes out there, and you know, and there's awards for those guys and everything else. Uh, this will this will make Scott laugh. The guy that came to my mind when Jeff brought this up was Miles Yetter. Uh, Miles Yetter. The weapon Miles that, <laughs> And Scott knows why. Miles is a guy that was a great kid, fought his tail off for every rep he could get. He was never ever a guy all through four years. You know, his senior year, he's he's working on kickoff return scout team, and he gets blistered in a practice like oh. like un- unnecessarily it wasn't a dirty block but it wasn't necessary and we're like what is going on here and mile crumpled like a pile of wet newspapers and you know what he popped up and he's like let's play the next play and and you know miles went on he graduated heidelberg went to university of dayton to mm-hmm. law school that guy's going to be an unbelievable success his stepfather's a lawyer great family but when, when Jeff said, who's the unsung guys, Miles Yetter popped into my head because I, I think the world of that kid because he fought not three years but four years of straight adversity of I'm trying to get on the field with a really good football team and he couldn't find a way, but he never gave up hope and he kept plugging along. And, and that kid, it might have as, as special a place in my heart as anybody ever played at Heidelberg because of his, per, his perseverance. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll share with you a, a young man named Daryl Poor. Uh, Daryl Poor was about 5'10", uh, ringing wet. He probably during the season 155. In fact, he, he, he played uh, football at about uh, 155. He went down and wrestled at about 130 like people do. And he played baseball, three, three, uh, three sports. He, he graduated number three in the class at Heidelberg. He, he went on, became a Green Beret. Then he went to medical school. Uh, the, the Army sent him to medical school. Then he became the, uh, in, in the Pentagon, became the uh, assistant director under the uh, Surgeon General of the United States and ended up being a general. And he was a kid that, uh, you know, at the end of the baseball practice, he was a kid that was put putting the bats in the bag. And like uh, Scott said, or Jerry said, uh, he was also the kid that uh, carried the dummies into the, <clears throat> to the locker room and, and, and all that sort of, n- n- nothing was ever below what Daryl Poor would do. He, he just did it all for us and be- be- became a general in the United States Army. So what a guy. And a great human and a true American hero with his story. Yeah. Yep. Yep. yep no doubt. No doubt. Is there one win that stands out for you guys that either an upset win, uh, a monumental win that, that stands out for each of you? Well, I'll, I guess I'll speak to that in, in the, you know, in the early seventies and uh, late sixties, it was Baldwin Wallace and uh, Wittenberg. Those were the two powerhouses. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we stepped in and won it in 72, but if you look at everything around that, it was uh, mostly Baldwin Wallace and Wittenberg. And uh, in 85, our, our Dick West and I's second year, we went down there and it was at, in Springfield, Ohio, which is where I grew up and I played a couple high school games in that stadium. And uh, when I grew up, I was actually a Wittenberg Tigers fan. Uh, and we went down there and uh, Shane threw for 400 yards, which at that time was a heck of a lot. In, in Hallett and Donaldson's day, that's just another day. But, <laughs> but, uh, but back then, back then that was, mon- that was a monster day. And, and we beat them down there and we beat them soundly. And uh, uh, that was uh, a, a big victory for the program and, and Dick coming in and, and uh, trying to get the program turned around. So uh, uh, that's one uh, victory that, that stands out in my mind. I got way too many. Uh, you know, it was my personally first win in four years. And I remember 
you know, almost crying on the sideline, and, and you know, the kids are crying, you know, the guys that were 0-30, and, and, you know, that was you know, Talent's first game as coach. And was, what the hell are you guys doing? You know, like, Mike, we haven't won in four years, man. <laughs> you got to let us have this, man. <laughs> um, you know, that was unbelievable. And obviously we had so many great, great wins uh, with Coach Hallett. Um, my personally was was a few years ago as head coach, and we beat John Carroll, and they were third in the country at that point. And we beat them by 25 and just had an unbelievable game. And some really – some kind of role players stepped up, like Donnie Walker, you know, never – never started a game and ended up taking a pick six. And we just, one of those unbelievable uh, uh, games we had uh, over at the stadium. I would, I would, <laughs> this will sound bad. I've got three that are benchmarks to me. Uh, the first one would be Beating Otterby or beating Oberlin, that I like, they stunk. So I didn't, that didn't get me fired up. Uh, beating BW that year when they were ranked, that was a huge ass deal. That was big. Um, beating BW in the last game to go to the playoffs, that was a really big deal. And beating BW when Cartel ran for as many yards as he wanted to get, that was a big deal. I'm sorry that's all against John Snell, who's a good friend of mine. I'm not sorry that any of that was against Jim Myers, who was a defense coordinator. Um, but those were those, those were three, and it just happened to be all against the same opponent. But those were three really good wins, and they weren't all Jim Myers fault. But um, you know, I felt like those were three signature wins for our program in establishing who we are at that time. You know, we're going to beat ranked teams in year one. We're going to find a way, as ugly as it was, to win a game, to go to the playoffs, and we're going to find a way to have a kid have a great day. And we needed that win that day, too. So those are not just one. I'm sorry, Jeff, I, I ruined the rules, but those were three pretty cool ones. <laughs> I'm, I'm the same and way. Every, uh, by the way, every win against John Carroll was a hallmark thing, too, by the way. <laughs> you know. yeah. Yeah. I'm the same way with uh, Scott Dawson, uh, uh, Coach. Uh, uh, there's so many, many, many great year, uh games and and homecoming was always a special day because uh, no matter if you were stag bowl champs or if you were you know struggling along you had those players come back and and uh you know talk to the team and uh, and, and encourage and and cheer on the teams uh one of my favorite days was uh, when we opened uh, uh Horniman Stadium and uh, to see the teams play on, on our own field. That, that was a, a hallmark for me to see Heidelberg play on campus uh, in, in the Horniman Stadium. I, that, was, that was a hallmark for me. Absolutely. Well, gentlemen, we'll wrap things up now. I, I can't thank you enough for, for joining us here on the Coaches Roundtable. Jim Getz, Jerry McDonald, Mike Hallett, Scott Donaldson. Um, thanks for sharing your knowledge today. Really appreciate it. Great to be here. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having us, Jeff. Yeah. Good seeing all you guys. Great seeing you guys. Thank you so much.